Hey everyone, welcome to the LTM Live Summit. Uh, 2020 has been a very interesting year for all of you, I'm sure. It certainly has been on our end. Uh, today, I'm joined by Chris Denny, CTO of Worthington Assembly, and Rob Cook, Director of Engineering Services at Calumet Electronics. And we've been invited here today to talk through and kind of give you the behind the scenes action on, on what happened with the open source ventilator project. And uh, this project has come up in a couple of other places in this conference too. So you'll get a chance to see all about it, but um, we wanted to kind of show you what it looked like on our end, how we did things and uh, some of the fun stories along the way. So without, um, without too much ado, let's just jump right into it. It's one thing when you're like working with a group of people on the internet and you're trying to make like an open source 3D thing. It feels very familiar and hobbyist to level. And then it's another thing when now suddenly on the phone with the hospitals and the doctors and you're hearing about the real cases. This is how many ventilators we have. This is how much time we have before we're at capacity. How fast can you make something? And now like talk about lighting a fire under your ass. Like, here we go, man. The American Hospital Association was suggesting that our entire hospital system in the United States may only have as many as 63,000 functional ventilators. And worst case scenario, we may need as many as 900,000. Because the truth is the virus is spreading very, very quickly and it's inconsiderate of borders. It's happening to every country, to every person uh, is being impacted by this all around the world. So you need a worldwide solution. What I did is I set it up with two very good friends of mine, Connell Laverty and David Pollard. The joke is we set up an enterprise scale organization made fully of volunteers spread remotely around the world. The designs were freely shared and iterated. Like our goal was to create an open source ventilator. And it is exploding. It started a week ago and already we've organized a thousand different volunteers, engineers, designers, medical professionals all across the globe. And just keeping things organized is an incredibly difficult task. And I'm just trying to do it for the US. Public channels, phew, private, phew. I put a brick down and then the wall just follows. So basically we have a million makers. The GET will have specific approvers in each area. In terms of hardware and electronics direction, I need something to give this team. That's the system circuit. Okay. Do we have to monitor temperature and humidity? We need tidal volume, respiratory rate, uh, intake, yeah, exhale at ratio, plateau airway pressure, driving pressure, and peak. We had the idea to like just put out a more detailed survey form that would capture people's skill sets, their interests, their experience. So that's how we picked the team to work on, on the LTM project for putting together these electronics. But also the development team, regardless of where they were, they were all working out the same design, version control. The team in West Michigan was able to go from design files to build prototype in less than 24 hours. Even volunteers from my competitors are now on our internal server here working on this project. So in times like this, we get to kind of like set all that other stuff aside. Really as humans, we can attack this problem. There are tons of OSV electronics teams. We're, we're one of them. Made ventilators from Home Depot. Um, <laughs> And more interesting is kind of like a suitcase that opens up. We have at least two respiratory therapists on the line. How much total pressure do you, does the machine need to be able to deliver? Heat needs to be adjustable from anywhere from probably zero to maybe 20. It is a real intermingling of worlds, both age, location, skill level, and then expertise. You know, these were ragtag bunches of self-assembled people scattered around the world, sitting at the main table with World Health Organizations, like large government bodies and large Fortune 100 companies. Now you're participating with Ford and Detroit yeah. right in your own backyard. The prediction was that we were five to 10 days away from hitting capacity on ventilators. What Google Sheets has done for sharing the specifications and the documents, Altium and Concord has made possible on the design side. People could get to that single source of truth for all the design information, 
they were able to collaborate with each other and that has been critical to the reason that we were able to get this far this fast you can cut this out extremely fast like this side panel takes 38 seconds to make uh, the other thing is once it's all together it is very very easy to go through and sanitize all the different touch points and we're going to be working with chris denny over at worthington assembly i said hey how can i help um i'm a manufacturer you know i'm an executive at this company and i have resources and machines what can i do to give you guys a hand even with materials and machine time and assembly you can put one of these together for a couple hundred bucks um, sticker price on a new ventilator is typically between 25 and 50 grand the design is just about ready we're going to build them all the hard work is paying off and it's becoming tangible and it's becoming usable yes so awesome. <laughs> here's our multi-board electronics assembly a ground up design developed by the global and local open source ventilator team. And then Monday we're sending these off to get made and Calumet Electronics offered to make a couple panels for us. And now it's just finding a manufacturer and figuring out what it takes to get through FDA and all these other steps we have to do to make it available in the US. This is class two FDA life support equipment. And there's a lot of regulations you have to go through. And the consultants we were talking to today told us, they're like, yeah, we're seeing all these ventilator designs come out, but we just know they're never gonna be able to be used. This project, uh, they said, was the first one they'd seen that actually looked viable and that they could see like really using in a hospital setting. We went from an idea to an organization, to an engineering team, to four physical prototypes, now to a validated, distributed, multi-board system that's going to keep people alive all in four weeks. When people do this and they just kind of put the bullshit aside and get organized and get focused and you pull out all the limits that humans self-impose, when you remove that and you come together, it's completely unstoppable. We are the decentralized special forces of design and we operate at a higher level than most task forces at the moment. Like a designer needs a CAD tool, we engineer together. You can't have the other without the one. So get out of your pajamas and open your laptops. Engineering's essential, let's get the work done. Because I've run think tanks and we've run tons of brainstorming exercises together. There's nothing like this kind of jazz music. So that's the end of the story, really. I, I don't think that the engineering community has ever been more connected. That's what gives me hope. Building that sense of community is, is what the world needs right now. It's incredible what can happen when everyone comes together. Like a layout needs a schematic, we engineer together. You can't have the other without the one. Stick figures look simple, but they hold all the data. Layouts need schematics, let's get the work done. This was the very first prototype. The idea was that the, the bag sits right in here. There's a belt that goes on to the spool. And all that happens is the belt. Like transmission lines need return paths. We engineer together. You can't have the other without the one. So back up your signals with unbroken reference plans. SI is important. Let's get the work done. This is the second prototype we had. A little bit more sophisticated. A little bit. And the idea here is there's a roller that comes through and compresses the bag this way. And there was a, a cam mechanism in here that didn't quite work out right. Like a fab shop needs data, we engineer together. You can't have the other without the one. So run your design checks, list all your fab specs, release all the drawings, make the processes run. Concept three, we really kicked it into gear. We have the arms here that clamp the bag itself, but um, with it just being the thin arm, 
there we weren't getting a lot of engagement on the bag and we weren't getting the same the right amount of volume like a project needs stakeholders we're engineered together you can't have the other without the one engineering procurement manufacturing test and shipping we all work together to get the boards done Used to having a 2,000 square foot workshop. I've condensed all that down to my dining room table here. Um, please forgive the mess, it's all hot off the press. I forgot how great that song is. <laughs> it's such a good song, right? Such a good song. Actually, a uh, fun fact, the Kelly Dack, the guy who, who wrote and composed that song, is uh, he was my CID instructor when I went and got certified. It's a great dude. You should absolutely try and talk to him in the Discord channels at some point if you haven't met him already. Awesome. Will do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's talk about uh, that phone call where uh, where you and Judy um, and DigiKey came together. Um, and again, like you guys kind of saw the first prototype. This project started out as just a, like a bag squeezer, essentially. And for that, we just needed a stepper motor in some way to kind of control that but uh chris how did you get roped into the into this i guess i well i think like a lot of people it was i mean everything nationally here in the united states all happened so so very quickly and i found myself um just sort of i don't know if terrified is the right word to use but just sort of in shock and thinking you know i have to be of use to this somehow so i reached out to um some of my contacts at Altium and I said, Hey, you know, we're looking to be able to support projects. What do you know about? And that's when they connected me with Judy and she said, uh, Hey, we're having a call about this open source ventilator project in like 20 minutes. Can you join us? So I was like, <laughs> yeah, what? All right, sure. And I, I had just gotten off the phone with, um, a friend of mine at DigiKey and I said, Hey, are you available? And and they're like, yeah, sure. What time? I'm like, well, now, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it all just happened so, so quickly. Yeah, no. And uh, remember on there, uh, we were kind of describing like what we were looking to do. And DigiKey was there both as obviously DigiKey, like we all know them, the distributor. Yeah. It was news to me that they had an internal electronics team just to design their own kind of automation things. That's right. Yeah. So he, so uh, Chris, Chris Barrett, as far as I'm aware, is kind of responsible for that team. And um, he had just gotten direction from his executive management that basically said, stop working on whatever it is that we need you to do internally and make yourselves available to support anything that can help, <clears throat> excuse me, anything that can help fight this pandemic. And um, so they were just like, all right, well, here, here we go. And uh, I think you had mentioned already, this was the design we're looking at on the screen right now was, you know, instead of saying open source ventilator driver, it, it said DigiKey on it somewhere. <laughs> uh, they they just basically gave us their design, said, is this a good starting point? Yeah. Yeah. And at that point, like, obviously the design evolved after it, but at the very beginning is, yeah, we need a stepper driver and input for some sensors and just a simple UI. And we were trying to make something that was really easy for anyone to make and even hand assemble. Um, we didn't want to prevent people from being able to do that. And this was fantastic. They just had it sitting there and they were ready to just open up the design for us. So, um, yeah. And I guess, Rob, what was going on at Calumet at the very beginning as the pandemic was, was picking up in the U S here? I mean, really, we had a lot of the same story as other board fabricators in the country, uh, which is that every ventilator producer, uh, in the United States and some in Europe were calling us and asking us if we could start producing ventilators. Um, we'd already been producing some components for um, some of our customers already and they you know tripled and quadrupled their their orders to guess yeah. to just rush them in and it was uh, you know not only was the craziness of the pandemic hitting us uh, within the factory trying to understand how we could stay open when everything around us was being shut down um, because we felt and we were getting, you know, letters and notifications from all over the place that, you know, we were critical infrastructure. We need these parts. You have to get them to us as quickly as we can. Um, but we really wanted to 
be able to contribute kind of on our own and, and something that we could bring to the table. Um, and so just having that uh, conversation and opportunity to participate in this it gave us that avenue. And I think that was really kind of one of the first times that I felt like, okay, this is not just us filling orders for customers. This is us actually really helping to solve the problem um, and do it in a really great way. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. So that was kind of the other theme, at least for us here is everyone had to figure out how to switch from working in like the traditional office environment, especially in the electronics industry, which is very infrastructure heavy to learning how to, to work from home. And a lot of people have been doing this already, but it was new for a lot of people as well. So um, yeah, let's just kind of talk about the tools that, uh, that you guys use and that we use on the project as well. Obviously a big part of it was Altium 365. And what wound up happening is as soon as Chris gave us that, this design where it was mostly what we needed. We had this whole team of engineers who were ready to start working on something. Um, and this is kind of like, well, this was the seed, right? It's like, here, this is the spot to start from. Let's grow from that. And the other thing that happened is OSV, especially at the beginning was the group was three people that started in Ireland. And I think at the time the like project kind of concluded, it was up over like two and a half or 3000 people total. But especially at the very beginning, we were getting hundreds of people all coming on the Slack channel. And when you have a lot of well-meaning volunteers, it's, there's a lot of clutter and there's a lot of noise that's going on. Um, so part of that was because of the design that DigiKey brought forward and the fact that we were able to get that distributed to people who already knew Altium, um, we were able to kind of like put our team on the map that like caught the leadership attention. And it's very different when you have a group of people saying like, Hey, I've got all this time. I'm ready to help. And like, what should I do versus, Hey, now we have a board. That's most of what we need. Let's adjust it. But we're pretty much there at least as we understood it at the time. Um, you know, I, I think every uh, volunteer organization activity that I've tried to help with, I mean, everything from, uh, you know, and stories that I heard from my father-in-law when he was helping with hurricane Katrina, it, you can get lots of volunteers, but getting them organized in a way to actually be productive is really what is difficult. And yeah. I think that was really what, what we saw here with this project. Yeah, and so obviously Slack was a big part of it. We used uh, Google Sheets to go through and poll everyone and like just get an assessment of everyone's well self-reported skill level and availability. And, and that was a big part of at least who made it on the design team for or the electronics team for this group is we sent out a, a Google form that would just asked for your experience, like what tools you knew. Um, and then, yeah, being able to see it all together was, was great. You just had your whole list of all the volunteers to go through and pick from. Um, yeah. And I think everyone is pretty much a zoom pro by now, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that tool you know, I mean, the beautiful thing about Zoom was how quickly everybody seemed to be able to pick it up. I mean, there's yeah. been other video conferencing tools for a while, but Zoom managed to keep video quality and audio quality and ease of multiple users, uh, you know, really fast. And, you know, we all use it and our whole company has been uh, picking up Zoom and not just Zoom, but obviously, you know, WebEx and, and Teams and some of the other tools. But, you know, this new ability to really functionally use video conferencing and collaborate, uh, it's kind of a, a new world that we're in. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally amazed that they didn't crash, right? Like just this enormous <laughs> hockey stick curve of adoption and it stayed up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw some statistic that said they went from 10 million subscribers to 200 million subscribers in the course of like a month. <laughs> it, it was something absurd like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think it's changed the way that people are going to work for a long time. And we keep talking about like, well, after the pandemic, when everything goes back to normal, it, it's not going, it's not going back to normal. Like even my team is like, yeah, we want to kind of travel the country a bit more. And I've got two young guys and they're really like, they're into the van life. Like one guy bought a Sprinter van from a flooring company and 
my firm or engineers like shopping for like short school buses. Cause that's what he wants to like drive around and live in. And for uh, like for programming, why not? Like the tools are there. 5 G's coming out too. So yeah, they're probably gonna have a faster internet connection than I am. It's a, uh, it's really interesting to see how like workflows have shifted and um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty, pretty insane. What do you think is going to happen at your companies? Do you think it's going to, I guess, what are your workflows like? It's, How's it going to change? It's already happened. Um, we have, you know, most of our purchasing people work remotely at least half, half the time, you know, they come in if they need to, uh, our engineers, if they need to be, you know, maybe they have a dentist appointment at four o'clock or whatever. Well, they'll just work from home that day. They can get a full day in without the commute and, it's already happening. I mean, this is, um, this is it. Like you said, it's not, it, and we all want it to go back to the normal in the sense of not being afraid of, of catching a very deadly disease, but yeah, that'd be great. I look yeah. forward to that. <laughs> but work in general is not going to go back to normal. We're going to adopt these new tools and, and, uh, it's, it's, I personally, I'm, I'm very happy about it. It, it gives everybody a little bit more freedom and, and it honestly, it keeps, um, employee re retention a little bit easier when you, when you give your employees these options and they're happy to have them. And it, I think overall it's been, it's been a big improvement. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're they're happy to have access to these kind of tools too. Um, it just makes their lives easier, even even without the remote work uh, and the ability to, because all of us have customers and suppliers and other people that we interact with that are not right across the street. I mean, they're everywhere from Asia to Europe to California to Florida to Texas, and so we have to be able to have uh, some ways of communicating. These improved remote communication tools made all of that easier as well, let alone letting people do some of their work from home. Yeah, yeah, and to that end, I think it's a great segue into this next section. So we've kind of talked about before, like grabbing a design and then making it available for everyone to work on it. But it's not just a matter of, can you build a design together? It's, can you get it made? And as we all know, and our audience knows too, there's a lot of things that can go wrong between the design is done phase and the you have boards to start testing phase. So let's kind of talk about that a bit. Um, so with this, we were, we used 365 and like it plugged in with the other cloud tools that we're using for communication. But um, I guess, how often do you think, uh, I'm gonna rephrase it a different way, how, wild was it that we were able to solve all the like manufacturing glitches in like a one hour phone call? It was my first experience in, in this kind of a collaborative environment where the design assembly and fab were all communicating at the exact same time on this one project to just bulldoze all the problems and get that field level. So it could just fly through. It was, it was my first experience and only experience so far. But I hope that I hope that it is not the last. <laughs> I yeah, I think this is probably going to be. It's definitely the way that we're always going to do things now until the next better thing comes along. But this really feels cutting edge. Rob, what is? Well, you know, we we got introduced to this Altium three sixty five concept. You know, last year at the Altium live event, and there was a a really cool skit. I'm sure it's still available out there to see. Um, that Lee and the team put together with uh, some guys in costumes and uh, at different locations in Germany and Spain and France. And um, at that point, it was like, wow, this, this could be something kind of cool. Uh, but then Dugan, uh, when he got a hold of me with Chris to actually talk about building some of these boards, he was like, well, I'll invite you to our Altium 365 server and you can take a look at the boards and then we'll, we'll get on a call. And I pulled up every single board file that we needed to build. And this phone call happened. And we, like Chris said, we hashed through all kinds of issues in an hour. And it, was, it wasn't so much issues because the boards were in pretty good shape, uh, but it was, well, what do you want to do about this? What are your preferences for this? How do you want to have things uh, marked and communicated? And all of those kind of um, aspects that this tool really just threw at us and made simple. 
I, I will say my favorite thing about it is it not only like got your eyes, both of your eyes on it sooner, but instead of every time we made a change, the design team having to send out like other documents for review, like once you're plugged in, you get to see the, the evolution of it live. And I don't have to keep sending the updates and like announcing them. I can focus on other things. Do you guys just are part of it and you can explore the design and spend as much time as you want looking on things. I don't have to go through myself and walk you through it. And it just makes for a much more efficient kind of communication. Yeah, that's a great point because then you're also saving time and not having to document everything because you just, all right, we're just going to fix this right here. All three of us just go, yep, yep, yep. Good to go. You know, moving on. It was, yeah. It was it's really like, nice. a, so I'm going to make a programming joke. It's like, instead of sending you the variable, I got to send you the pointer and then I got to go and do other things. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, there's... I, I'm always impressed by the state of cloud computing. And again, I remember that sketch from last year too and thought it was kind of gimmicky, but in a way that was like, oh, that's lame. But also like, I really want that right now, you know? Like I just well, wanted you, so badly for it to actually work and not just be marketing fluff. Right, right. That was the key. I mean, it was a healthy dose of skepticism. Yeah. Um, but with just enough potential to say this, this might, they might have something here. Yeah. And to have a chance to actually use it real time, real, I mean, I think I'm with Chris, you know, we're, we're preaching it to any of our customers to say, Hey, have you thought about, you know, doing it this way? There's a little bit of a paradigm shift, right? You're, you're no longer just getting your design package already and then sending it to your, your purchasing person who's sending it out for quote, who then is uh, getting gathering quotes from three different suppliers. Uh, and in the case of a circuit board, there's sometimes middleman for the other mechanical components or the, you know, the PCB itself. By the time they get all that and back to the, the buyers and a purchase orders cut, you know, that's days and weeks from when that design was really ready to be reviewed. Yeah. This changes that paradigm getting some commitment early on with your, your team to really be involved. You can yeah. get that kind of quoting activity and stuff done afterwards, but this takes advantage of the technical expertise of the people involved. Right. And I will say like, you guys probably saw it in the video, like at the very beginning of it, I was not getting a lot of sleep. <laughs> I was <laughs> in a lot of directions and uh, yeah. Now I've got a ring light and my face is nice and rosy and nice, but I was like, it was, it was a lot of work and a lot of time just trying to keep everything organized. And the only way to organize that many people is to have like some tools that come together on it. And I just want to show you like the electronics on their own are complicated enough. And, um, but that's not even the whole part of this build. The whole rest of it was coordinating with the mechanical teams and getting all those parts right. And like, when you look at the exploded view of the assembly, like there's a lot of stuff that went into this. And this was not like, the project started off like, let's make a 3D printable ventilator, which is a great ambition, but um, what well, it's limited in what it can actually achieve. This grew from that and it turned into, let's make an easily manufacturable ventilator that a lot of people can do. And then we were one team, but what wound up happening is all these different ventilator projects made ventilator designs based on the different processes that they had. Like one was heavily reliant on sheet metal because it was in an area that had a lot of metal processing. This one, um, West Michigan actually has, um, we've got Herman Miller, we've got steel case here. We've got, um, um, anyway, the, this is set up almost to be made like furniture. Like when you look at the patterns on like the cutouts on the side panels and like even the way the fasteners came together, it's designed to go together like a cabinet almost. And it's kind of like a West Michigan flair to the design. But the important thing is like when you're designing something like this in such a short time frame, there has to be good communication and everything has to happen fast and accurately. And there's not a lot of room for error, especially when you realize that everyone who was doing this was volunteering their time. So it's, yeah, there, there's just um, a really high need for accurate, fast communication. So moving on from here, um, let's kind of hear some more 
of the backstory, Rob, of what was going on at Calumet, like later on with this, like, how do you? Yeah, so, you know, we, we joke a lot about with boards and when we get files from customers, you know, what percentage of designs go on hold? And, you know, the joke is it's all of them, right? <laughs> yep. When we started doing all of that, you know, preloaded collaboration, you know, you know, my team, who was very busy at the time, you know, we were trying to fit this in without disrupting our major production lines. And we had five different boards for this project. And we put all of the tooling, all the designs together, uh, had the boards all on the floor in processing uh, within one day. And we had all five of the boards uh, through the factory, no issues no scrap, which is ridiculous, <laughs> out the door to Chris uh, within 15 days. Um, and I know 15 days sounds kind of long for a quick turn PCB, but when you realize that we were trying to fit this in with all of the other uh, thousands, literally, of ventilator orders that we were getting, um, it, it was a pretty reasonable turn time. Yeah. But Again, the key for us was there was no interrupts to the process. Um, these boards were, like Dugan said before, they were designed to be easy to fab, and they were, uh, which was really great. And then we had the opportunity to uh, get all the other questions and communication dealt with up front. It just made it a, a pleasure to work on. <laughs> so you had mentioned going from receiving files to having the tooling and everything ready to go on the floor in a day. What is, what is a typical timeline for that? You know, our, our typical timeline, if things are um, going the way they usually do with questions and sendbacks and updates, it's anywhere from five to seven days. And in the case when you have, um, you know, middle men entities involved, uh, it can be as much as three weeks or, or six weeks. Uh, it's just design cycles and change notices and all the things that everybody deals with for change management control. You know, if, if I get a, a requirement that says I, ne I need to fit uh, this kind of marking and the space for that marking doesn't match and I bring that up as a question, well, it can be two weeks before the right person even gets the question in front of them. Yeah. And this, we eliminated that, said, forget it. We're, we're done with that mantra. We're, we're going to get, get all that stuff answered right away. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a nice change of pace, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so Chris, why don't you give us a little bit of background on what was going on at, at Worthington here? Yeah. So um, we were keeping in close communication with Rob uh, to make sure that we understood when the boards were going to arrive. And, um, you know, I, I, as is typical of me, I I'm bouncing around in a million different directions and I hadn't actually talked to anybody about building these things yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going on faith that, you know, uh, I, either I would have to build them myself after hours or I, you know, I would figure something out. Um, but while he was building those, we were finalizing the, um, or while Rob was working on the PCBs, we were finalizing the bill of materials with the engineering team. Um, and once we got sort of the canonical bill of materials, okay, this is stamped, ready to go. So, so to speak, I said, all right, well, how, okay, who's going to pay for these? And I was talking to you, Dugan about, you know, cause there was a, uh, there was, yeah, we had, a, we had, had some Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know what? DigiKey gave us the design. May as well see if we, they can give us the parts too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I reached out to uh, Chris again at DigiKey and I said, hey, what do you think about this? No response. Email the next day. Hey, uh, did you get that? No response. And I'm so like, okay, man, now I'm starting to sweat bullets. Finally, I emailed him again that following Monday and he goes, yep, it's all set. You, you guys will have these in a couple of days. And, and he just went up, he was going up the chain, but he was too busy to respond. And at an executive level, they agreed to donate hundred percent of the parts to build these, which was a couple thousand dollars, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a, uh, I remember cause I was getting the same like pings from the nonprofit cause they're like, we were building 
face shields and um, all, all kinds of PPE, right? And they're like, hey, uh, the money's starting to go away. Like, do you, do you still need this? And I was like, yeah, yeah, save me a few grand. We're, we're going to need it. <laughs> and then I uh, got to say, oh, n- never mind. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got to make sure I give a shout out to our COO, Todd Broussard, and our CEO, Steve Byro, who just said, yeah, go do it. And uh, they didn't even question the material awesome. for us or our time. Yeah, it's incredible generosity from all these companies. And it, it really felt like engineering with cheat codes. It's like, <laughs> Altium yeah. gave us the licenses. You guys gave us the boards. DigiKey gave us the parts. The designs were there. Everyone was responding instantly. We had all the best tools, like Slack, Slack. Slack sponsored the project too and opened oh, all wow. that up. It's a, uh, yeah, I think it kind of like ruined my expectations of turnaround time. <laughs> <laughs> Because now I'm like, well, I know how fast we could go. Like, oh yeah, come on, let's let's do it. Let's so, do it. So one, once we actually got the parts from DigiKey, we had we had to like it was it was sort of like they they all arrived and everybody in receiving was like, Chris, what are these parts? What do these go to? It's like, yeah, 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 I'll get to that. You know, Rob's still working on the boards, kind of kind of a thing. Uh-huh. And then finally, uh, Rob sent me tracking info on the boards, and I'm going, oh man. Uh, now I got to figure out what I'm going to do here. I got to talk to my wife. When can I stay late and I can build these things at night? And yeah. we had so much going on at the time. And I decided, well, you know, we have, we have this business partner uh, circuit hub that we actually took these designs and uploaded to, and we use their platform a lot just to kind of scrub data for us. And it helps us to get it in the format we need. And uh, I went to their CEO uh, again, as Rob gave a shout out to the, the people who actually, actually forked over the money for this stuff. I went to the CEO of circuit hub, Andrew Seddon, and I said, Hey, you know, are you willing to, uh, you know, basically donate assembly time to this? And I went to, uh, our president, Neil Scanlon and our treasurer, uh, Rafal Dabaki. And I said, are you guys okay with donating assembly time, man hours, basically to getting these built? I said, I don't have a problem coming in at night and the head of marketing for Circuit Hubs, she said she'd come in at night, and give me a hand. And there was other engineers at Circuit Hub that were like, yeah, just let us know. We'll show up. We'll, we'll build these things when, you know, normally machines aren't running. And, uh, but then we realized all of us are very, very busy people. And we thought, well, maybe there's something that could, that could be done. So the management at Worthington and, and uh, Circuit Hub were all on board to just say, yep, push them through and the beautiful thing is they didn't say like well make sure you get these things done first they were just like all right here's a schedule move everything down slide all this up get them through as quickly as possible and and they made it happen which was it was great and everybody on the floor like i don't know if you had the same experience rob but it was like i mean we worked on not just this project but a lot of a lot of other ventilator projects this project in particular because it was open source, because it was voluntary, everybody just felt so good about it and was so excited to work on them and were taking pictures of them and sharing them with their family. And it just got this great warm, fuzzy feeling for everybody in the floor. Yeah, and the boards came out beautifully. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about coordinating on the panels and like the coordination between you and and Rob, the, the designers, never get to see you probably <laughs> so uh i'll speak to to my end basically i i go to rob and i say you know he, here's kind of what we need in order to be able to hold these and and so if you, you're looking at the picture on the left there that's one of our pick and place machines and you see how it's clamped in there and it has these overhead clamps well you know you see parts right up to the edge of the actual board so we have to build a picture frame around that otherwise we'd be clamping on top of parts and we couldn't build these things so We had to define those edges. We had to um, put the fiducials on and everything. But unfortunately, we don't have a picture of it here. There's also a micro USB port we had to account for because those actually dip below the, uh, yeah, there you can see it there, that micro USB port. Yep. It hangs off the edge and it actually dips below the surface of the board. So we had to make sure that, or, you know, we had to make sure to tell Rob and his team, please account for this because if you don't, then we're going to have some major quality issues on that. Mm -hmm. And, that was another thing we were able to solve using uh, 365 is we were able to all see that all at once, make a comment on it, make sure it was clear to every party involved that had to manage it that, you know, to account for it. Yeah. It's just an incredible effort on, on everyone's part to go through and, and make this possible. And um, yeah, again, I just want to say thank you both Chris and Rob for your personal time on making this project realized and also um 
I know like behind you, there's a whole organization and also same with Rob, like for every one person who gets to be like interviewed in a setting like this, there's a hundred other people behind them who all contributed. And absolutely, um, yeah, there were so many people who added so much value and spent so much of their own personal time as well as their company's time, maybe like without telling them first, Chris. <laughs> but um, I do, I, I feel like a total imposter because at the end of the day, the only thing I did was just sit here in front of a computer and talk about stuff. Like I didn't actually do anything physical to make these things happen. You know, it no, was just connecting I, the dots. I know what you mean. And like, I joined this project thinking I was going to design like a circuit board or like maybe a sub circuit if there were enough people. And it turned out being, um, well, there were, there were hundreds of electrical engineers. And yeah, just uh, connecting the right people was something uh, that was really necessary. So that that's awesome. how I was able to kind of help out. Yeah, and actually, we should make sure to thank Judy Warner too, because she was part of the dot connector. Yep, uh, big time. Whole event as well. And uh, yeah. she, I remember she called me first. Do you know this uh, Dugan Carnesis? I was like, oh yeah, I met him last year at, at Altium, at the Altium event. She's like, oh, perfect. He needs your help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. So uh, that's all the time that we have today. Um, we're going to be taking questions in a little bit here. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, um, for joining us for this panel.